Okay, welcome back everybody. Welcome to the Overcoming Cultural Divides and Differences and how we can convert strangers and even enemies into our friends. This is a vlog for those of you who have been following along. We're trying to figure out in the midst of all the differences that our country seems to have been experiencing over the last few years as amplified by the distances that we have now been experiencing because of the pandemic, how do we talk to each other? You know, what are the ways that we can figure out uh, common ground? Um, and even if it's not common ground, a common experience, so that we can understand each other. One of the stories that I've told uh, during this, uh, the last few months, is when I was doing a consulting assignment with a, a family business, and they really disagreed with each other on everything and called the police on each other. I mean, it, was, it, was really, it was really pretty bad stuff. And I had them sit down and tell stories about what they thought was valuable in their life, or just examples. And then we shared them. And they still disagreed with each other, but they recognized the power of the sincerity of each person's story and what it meant to them. And even though they still disagreed, they understood something about the authenticity and the sincerity of the person that they were able to grab onto. And so sometimes it's common things that we find that we didn't know before. Sometimes it's uncommon things that we can still hold on to as a way to find ways to talk with each other. And over the last couple of months, we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff. We've talked about dogs, music, sports, business, religion. And today we're talking about film, how film might be a way for us to overcome those cultural divides and differences. And we have an ideal person to talk with today and my friend Kristen Hahn. Uh, Kristen has a long you know, experience in the film industry. She's the executive producer currently of Apple TV's The Morning Show. Uh, you may have watched some of her uh, films where she not only wrote the screenplay, but also was the producer for Disney's Stargirl and Dumplin'. Uh, she's won awards over the years, including with the Amsterdam International Documentary Festival for Anthem some years ago. Um, also, uh, the Women's Image Network for Five. And more recently, she was a nominee for her film, uh, for Leo Award, uh, Tumble Down, which was a film that we brought her out to Indiana University to screen and to interview and to talk about. And it's something that I want to talk about a little bit later today with respect to, to music. Um, like last month's uh, guest, Jerry White, Kristen is one of those people that could talk about every single one of these cultural artifacts that I have been talking about over the last year because she has such a wide experience and she's th such a thoughtful person. Um, we ended up getting to know each other about 10 years ago. In fact, I was looking at through some old emails and it's actually been 10 years at this point. Um, I teach a course, I've been teaching a course in comparative spirituality for over 20 years. And about 10 years ago, I came across Kristen's book, In Search of Grace. It's torn here. That's not out of disrespect. It's because I use it so much. Uh, I teach it in multiple classes over the years, and Kristen has very kindly Skyped and Zoomed and, and um, you know, everything into the classes as well. Um, it's my view that this is the most accessible book on comparative spirituality that you can possibly find. Uh, if you want to take a first step into understanding different spiritual traditions in this country, you cannot do better than Kristen's book, in part because she tells every chapter is a story. It's her story of going in and talking to people, the experiences that she had, the conversations that she had. And so, I mean, even in terms of religion and spirituality, she's a great person to talk with. But today, it's mostly, although who knows what's tangent we will run off into, but it's mostly about film. And as a starting point, um, though, maybe even more broadly than film, I mean, if there's anything that film and literature are, they're telling stories. And Kristen, I know that you are passionate about the power of storytelling. And so I just wanted to start off with your, your, your thoughts and, and sentiments of what is it about storytelling that gives us the opportunity to maybe reach across a divide and, and find something in the other person that we can kind of hang on to? Mm. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I always love talking to you and um, I so appreciate that you are so interested in all these, uh, all these intersections between <clears throat> all the things that you're interested in, from dogs to business to peace and storytelling. And I do think all of these things are related. So I, I just think it's so um, insightful that you've always 
been in pursuit of them. Uh, it, others might think, well, what do these things have in common? I think they have, I think they have everything in common. And um, I also think it re was really so brilliant that you got that family to tell stories as a way to bridge um, a negotiation or, you know, get back to the table together. Um, and it does speak to what film, I believe, film and television and any kind of storytelling, really, music, it's all storytelling, um, what it does for us as human beings. I, I guess my broad observation is that we're, you know, we're visual people by nature. We're visceral, sensorial people by our species. And so we oftentimes need to hear or see things in order to believe them, in order to relate to them. And so, and since the dawn of, of man, right, since we started here. So I think storytelling now has evolved to being uh, so, you know, sophisticated in a sense in films and television, everything feels so real, but it's, it's really just a story. And yet people can go to see movies and, and be scared to death. They can be brought to tears. They can have an epiphany as if they're seeing real life. Um, and I think there's just something so powerful about seeing someone go through something either you've gone through yourself or that you're curious about that you haven't gone through that you can viscerally now experience secondhand. And it, it's, it's how we learn and, and grow empathy. Um, and empathy is, you know, frankly, the key uh, to human relationships, really, um, in my opinion. So, you know, people say storytelling helps us feel less alone. Well, yes, that's absolutely true. And I, I say it myself. Um, but I think on a deeper level, it can, it can save lives. It can save relationships. Um, in a sense, if you add that up collectively, it could help save the planet uh, because it can educate us about things like global warming. I mean, look at you know Al Gore's documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. That was mind blowing what he accomplished in one one film, um, in a, in a sense of awakening a collective, uh, and it can it can stir it can really stir change, um, but it can also help you understand someone else's experience in a way that I think can change racism, can change misogyny, can change um, prejudice of all kinds. Uh, so that's why I believe in it wholeheartedly. I think if you understand someone's story, it's so much harder to dehumanize them and to attack them and to judge them. Um, and so I love storytelling, even if it's around a table uh, or if it's on a, you know, in a film or, or music. I find it equally effective. As, as usual, when I hear you talking, I can think of about 16 things that I wanted to just react to because it's, it, it's, it's so rich of what you were just saying. And, and uh, one of the things that, as you were talking, Kristen, that, that came to mind was way back a long, long time ago when I was a graduate student, getting longer and longer as you see the amount of gray hair up there, is uh, uh, at a professor who really believed in the power of storytelling. It was an ethics class. And he said that it's one thing about telling your story, which is powerful to be able to tell our own stories, but it's also to find your place in someone else's story. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you were talking about empathy, I mean, I think that's really so crucial that you know, we can talk about what's important to us and that's great. I mean, we need to have our voice. We need to be able to articulate what, we think, what is important to us, what's been important in our lives, why we, why we come to things that the way we are. But to be able to understand that you are in someone else's story and that you play a role in someone else, it's not all about you, it's your, the supporting cast of somebody else's story is also an empathic moment that really helps us, I think, overcome those, those, those divides and, and differences. So, um, um, and when you were talking about, you know, from the time, you know, if we were you know, sitting around in caves and fires and stuff like that, uh, I always tell my ethics students, that if they just remember two things about the class, the story, I tell, had them tell a story about something that they thought was good, the same assignment that I gave in that consulting room, um, what you thought was good, and then I showed them a film at the end. I said, if you just remember the film and you remember your story, 
everything else comes together. I mean, all the philosophical principles and the psychological biases and the legal stuff that I talked about, those are fine. But you remember the stories and you remember stories. You may not necessarily remember the principle, but you remember the story. I mean, it's, it sits with you and grabs you. So um, anyway, I'm getting carried away here. Yes, I, yes, no, uh, but story does. It really does. And that's why with In Search of Grace that you, that you brought up, um, it, that's why I, and I thank you for noticing that, that you know, each chapter is a story, instead of telling you the sort of, you know, tenets of each religion, or I, I can't, you know, those are facts, and that's about memorization, and it's a different part of your brain. I wanted people to have a visceral sense of each religion and kind of remember it because I told a story mm -hmm. about the practice, about what people do, not what they believe. And if you understand what people do, you have a kind of intuitive sense of what they believe and why they do what they do. So the why is kind of infused in the doing. And it's much easier for us as humans to, to absorb stories and imagery. So hopefully you remember in the, in the chapter about Judaism, oh, it was the Sabbath, right? They sat around the table and they had that dinner. And why do they do that? Well, hopefully you kind of remember why they do it because it's, there's a story around why. Um, and I think it's, it is how we absorb. It's, it's part of our DNA. Um, and I do think, you know, that the most important, I, I think the most profound thing that stories are doing for us right now um, is helping tell the story of vulnerability because every single person in some way is vulnerable. So the person you hate or the person you're, you know, in conflict with, whatever, the truth is every single person in any dynamic, in any relationship, um, whether it's friend, friend or foe, each of those human beings have some vulnerability and storytelling, I think the most powerful storytelling is the kind that very subtly helps you understand that. Um, I was just watching a, a trailer for a, a new movie that Apple has coming out, um, starring of all people, Justin Timberlake, the, the you know, amazing musician and, and singer songwriter and he's starring in this movie called palmer and i was I, I was in tears just watching the trailer and if you can do that in two and a half minutes take a busy person who's just kind of flipping through things on their computer and s shock them into paying attention and bring them to their knees in two and a half minutes you're, you're doing something right in my opinion and it's a reminder that we're all connected. That's the that's for me what storytelling really ultimately does. It reminds us we are all connected and we're here to learn and grow. And we're each, as you said, cast as as supporting role, a supporting role in many people's stories in that growth process. And that's how I view life. And that's, you know, those are the kinds of stories I'm drawn to telling, are the kinds that help us realize that and connect with that and help us heal a little bit. Because if you can see someone in a story forgive someone else and find it in them to forgive when they feel so angry or resentful or they've had a hard life, they deserve to be angry and they deserve to be the play the victim. And you see them not play the victim. You see them step out of that and move past that and move toward someone with forgiveness and love and empathy. It helps you understand that you can do that too. And that's where I think storytelling becomes the great um, aspirational leader for us, you know? Great stuff, great stuff. Well, let's talk about some films. Um, could you come up with um, um, three, five, two, whatever, um, some films that you think would be really good films that, uh, or are good films that kind of help us think through how to overcome our cultural divides and, and, and differences that help you reach across and, and uh, connect with somebody else. Any, any nominees? We'll call them the Kristen Awards. The nominees. Well, let's see. I would, I'd probably start with, um, the. I would say the first film, I, w I went to film school at USC and uh, the film, the documentary film that really rocked my world that I thought that took me into a, into a, a world that I had never been and will never probably get to see that really changed my idea of what film is capable of doing uh, was a documentary 
um, called Titicut Follies. Do you know about Titicut Follies? Mm -hmm. So this is my obscure film reference for those film buffs who are watching and particularly your students who are cinephiles. Um, this is called, it's a film made by uh, a documentary filmmaker, Frederick Weissman, who's one of the great, you know, founding fathers of cinema verite of, of just, you know, there was no commentary in this film. It was just raw footage. Mm. It was very pure documentary, no point of view, no, you know, uh, no music. I don't think there was even any music in it. It was literally pure, just documentary footage. And he documented uh, an institution uh, for the criminally insane mm. in the 60s. And it was shocking and riveting. And it really just put a microscope on how we view and how we treat mental illness in our country. And talk about empathy. I, I was wrecked for like probably years, frankly, after that in a, in a good way. I was my, awakened to our institutional systems, our government, how government handles these things and treats these things, you know, uh, treats people who are, who are vulnerable. And, uh, and that film was barred. The, the government, the, the Supreme Court barred that film from being viewed for 30 years. And then I went to film school and it had just been released. It literally like 1990, it was um, finally allowed to be viewed. And I saw it in film school and now you can see it, you can get it. And it really is amazing. So I will say just that, that was a documentary that I thought really helped deepen an understanding um, about a topic that I, I otherwise might not have understood. Um, and it gave me a lot of empathy. Um, I would say, you know, other films that have, that have, you know, there, there's just so many. I mean, recently there's Just Mercy, wow. which, you know, is powerful and obviously, you know, based on a true story. Um, I hope people see that. I also find comedy to be such a powerful tool uh, to inviting people inside of a story that they might not otherwise want to visit because it feels too heavy or it feels like, uh, I'm not in the mood for that. I just want to escape. I just want to like relax and chill and see a fun movie. So a film like Black Klansman is a great film mm. for, you know, you think like it, you, you, it is comedic. It is, um, it's very darkly comedic, but it's also really insightful and it really takes you inside of a journey that it could have been. And I remember when that film was being developed originally, that story, I was aware of that story. Um, and it was originally, I think, being developed as a drama, as a straight drama, because it lends itself to that. And so it was kind of a brilliant twist um, uh, for Spike Lee to uh, turn that into a comedy. Um, and I thought it was so effective. Um, I mean, looking at like kind of the Black Lives Matter chapter of, of all of our education that we've all been, um, you know, going through and looking at white privilege and what that means. Um, uh, you know, another documentary that really affected me this past year was I, I Am Not Your Negro, mm -hmm. um, which is by um, uh, a, a documentary filmmaker, Raul Peck, I think is his name. Um, that was that was very powerful, um, and uh, I'm trying to think of other films that that um, have. I mean, there's just there's thankfully so many. There are so many incredible storytellers out there, it, it, speaking to us, telling us similar stories, but in such completely different ways. Which is what I love, love, love about about our individual voices as storytellers that, um, you know, I think about like In Search of Grace as a book about religion and spirituality and how there are so many books about religion and spirituality out there. If you, if you go, if you could find a, a bookstore, a brick and mortar bookstore, you'd see, you know, 50, 100, whatever. But each one has a slightly different point of view. Each one has a slightly different voice. Each one has a, a different way of communicating. Um, the information, and we're all drawn to different voices. Different voices speak to us, um, you know, resonate differently, right? So 
my way of telling the story, you know, resonates with you and it may resonate with others. Uh, a more cerebral version of that story may resonate with other kinds of readers, you know, um, they may like just the facts, those kinds of that, that, that way of, of learning about it may just be, may resonate with them. So I, I think the fact that we have so many different ways of telling stories and so many different voices is what, is what makes it, it exciting. Uh, these are, I've been taking notes as you were talking here some with, because some of these are ones that I have not heard of. Some I have just mercy I've heard, but some of the others I, Black Hands I've heard, but not all of them. So I've been taking notes, but there was something that you said that I really wanted to follow back up on that I really liked a lot, and that was about comedy. Because I think that, that being able to share humor, to share a laugh, I think is so crucial and is something that can can really extend uh, across you know, various kinds of differences. I mean, in a previous vlog, one of the, the examples that I use, and it's one of my favorite ones, is uh, maybe it's because of the time that I was you know, growing up in, in um, uh, that you know, in the 80s, um, you, you couldn't have two people more at loggerheads than Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Uh, but what would they do at the end of the day? They would sit down, they'd have a, you know, a drink, and they would tell Irish jokes. And there's something really good about that mm. in terms of just being able to, to share a joke. And I think yeah. that comedy and film, I mean, to be able to share a laugh with someone, I think is really you know, very powerful. And I think with my students, again, in my classes, that one of the last things that we do prior to the end of the term is, of course, we have a formal model that they have to apply for their research paper with three kinds of this and three kinds of that and all that kind of you know, typical academic stuff. But I make them uh, come up with a 90 second video where they're supposed to splice together film clips that illustrate the points as a way for it's It's a lighthearted way to conclude the, the term. But it's also a way for them to not just think of something that's a memory, a memorization, but something that, again, a, a story or an instance that you know, they viscerally can feel. And the ones that the students always resonate with are the ones that share a joke. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that in my field, in, in ethics, and of course, if we're talking about overcoming cultural divides and differences, it's, it's a serious issue. I mean, that's why we're looking at it. But not to forget the ability to share a laugh with each other or a joke with each other I mean, is really a powerful way to do that. And I was so pleased when, when you were talking about you know, the, the, the richness of comedy and what it can mean in, in, a, in a film. Yeah, absolutely. And you see it in your own family, right? Meaning not yours per, per se, but in families, particularly now with so much political divide right now um, and around the holidays when you're at least Zooming with your family. Um, you know, I have many friends who have very conservative family members in different parts of the country. And, and honestly, being able to laugh together is, is, has been so crucial. Finding, finding in the Venn diagram of any relationship and any family dynamic, finding enough crossover to stay together, in my opinion, you know, relationships are defined by uh, enough shared reality, you know, to, to, to stay together. And I think that's true of a, you know, of a marriage, of, of any kind of close friendship, of, of a professional relationship, of a family dynamic. And, and so, yeah, if at least you have some, some family jokes and some family history stories to, to, to lean on. Um, it can probably keep people together during these times where we feel really divided. Um, so yeah. I agree. Or a movie to watch. I mean, nothing makes me happier than getting a text or an email from somebody saying, I watched Dumplin' with my dad or my grandpa, who, you know, was probably very conservative. And, you know, the idea of drag queens or... Um, of different aspects that come up in this film um, that we laughed and we cried and we had the best time. It's like, oh, that's exactly why I do what I do. I just, to give people a shared experience that kind of brings them a little closer together. And hopefully, you know, if I can get a, a grandpa to cry, I, I've, I'm, my work here is done. Right, right. I, just to resonate before I move on to the next question, uh, I just want to resonate with the, the whole issue of all of these films and, and other things being ways to bring diverse families together. I'm going to try to write a book that comes out of this, this, this vlog series. And my, I've written the first chapter, and the first chapter is actually the day that my wife and I got married. 
And the, uh, my, my family was very politically different, very, including, you know, two twin cousins, first cousins, redheaded twin cousins. One was an arch conservative, the other was an arch liberal. And I, as we were assembling for the, uh, the, the family photo, the typical family wedding photo, uh, I turned around and my family had, without any planning, had assembled themselves um, exactly according to their political dispositions, from far right to far left, with every nuance in between. And wow. who's right in the center? My wife and I, who we are pretty well in the center. And we've laughed over the years that, that we, we're, we kind of get everybody to talk to each other. But right. how do they talk to each other? They do it through exactly what all these vlogs are about. They do by talking about their favorite film, some sort of a sports thing, what the dog is currently doing. They tell a joke. I mean, all of these things were the ways that they were able to maintain a relationship, even amid their political differences. And what you were just talking about is exactly front and center of the way that those things happen. So, um, right. Well, completely. and and to that point, you know, a, what what are we afraid of, right? We're afraid of what we don't understand or what we don't know, the, the unknown, right? So a lot of racism comes from just not knowing, um, not having not having had a relationship with someone of color, for example. And so if if you're able to show a story that actually takes you inside that experience, it can it can change. It really can change a mind, you know, and, and then it can change a conversation and then that conversation can grow. And so I do think, you know, like the fear factor is largely what film and storytelling can get past um, by bringing you inside of an experience um, and lessening the fear, lessening the unknown. Well, let me um, uh, move on here just a little bit. So as I indicated when I was introducing you, um, you have so many different hats that you have worn and currently wear. Um, you're a screenwriter, you're a producer, you are a business person, you are a woman leading a business. Um, you have done a film I, I talked earlier about Tumble Down, where you know, the main character, or one of the main characters, um, was dead. And the only way that we really know anything about that main character is to listen to that character's music. And so, I mean, you have a ear, so to speak, for how music communicates who we are as people. Um, and so I'm just wondering, given all that, of course, we talked about In Search of Grace you know, throughout our conversation here. I just wonder, drawing beyond film um, on all these experiences of any other things that you would say are important ways for us to cross cultural divides you know, generally or in our daily lives today, I mean, not, not everybody who's going to be watching this, in fact, I'm sure very few of them watching this are going to be, you know, film producers and screenwriters, and they're probably not going to write a book on comparative spirituality, although they might, you never know. But, you know, just in terms of our, our daily interaction with each other, as we're looking at the challenges that we have right now, I mean, just kind of what's your, what's your sense of what, you know, any given person can do to move us toward a, um, or relocate our, our, our society in ways that we can, we can appreciate each other and view us as being part of the same narrative, even while we have different roles or casts or disagreements within that narrative? Well, I think asking, uh, finding your way into asking people about their story is, is really the, the key. Um, it can be as simple as, um, you know, where, so where'd you grow up? Uh, you know, asking people about their origin and, and getting them to talk about their origin story is, is, such, a, is such a powerful tool. Um, I, a friend of mine had a birthday last week and we were on a text chain with friends and I realized I, I don't really know anything about her mom and dad. And to not know anything about a friend's mom and dad means like you're kind of missing out on, you know, we're, we're so shaped by our childhoods. I was like, I'm not even 100% sure I know where this person was born. And we're, we've been friends for years. And I said, you know, on this text chain, can you just tell us like where you were born? And can you send us a picture of your mom and dad from when you were a kid and, and tell us a little bit about your, your mom and dad? Oh my God, it was like a day of texts going back and forth, 
we were all like learning so much about this person just based on on that one question you know of like can you like where were you born and what was your mom and dad like it it really was revelatory i learned more about this friend in one day of texting than i had in years of being friends and it was so fascinating and it really was about talking telling a story she told a story a, a very key story about her dad and a very key story about her mom and man then everybody else on the text chain was like relating to it and my dad this and oh i had the same relationship with my mom and you know and it was not what you would expect it was a very unconventional a very unexpected relationship with her mom and her dad the dad was more of the maternal figure and and anyway i i asking someone about their story with a simple question is one of the greatest revelations of life and i learned that when i made anthem my first mm -hmm. documentary um I learned about the power of asking a simple question and how everybody is honestly dying to tell their story and everybody has a story to tell. I, we would walk into a diner in like, I remember South Dakota, we walked into a diner, there were three people in this diner and the most gruff looking man sitting at the counter and, and he had just pulled up, he was, a, he was driving a big rig and he had sat, he sat down at the counter and I was nervous to like strike up a conversation with him. Um, and I had my camera, I had my video camera and my friend who I was making the documentary with, we were like 25, um, you know, I walked up to him and I said, I'm sorry, you know, sorry to interrupt, you know, we were making a, a documentary film when we were wondering if we could interview you. And at first he was gruff and, and like totally confused, obviously, like, who are these girls and why are they wanting to interview me? And, and we're in the middle of small town, South Dakota. And, it, but within about three minutes, this man was telling us his story. And literally, we were in tears. We were laughing. We spent like two hours together. It, it was like such a life-changing experience. And those experiences I kept collecting on Anthem. And we just did it. We would just go out on a limb. Because we held a camera, we could start asking a perfect stranger questions. And we got to know so many different kinds of people because of that. It was like a, a weird card into people's lives. Like, hi, we're making a documentary. Can we interview you? And it really taught me how I had, I would never approach that man in, at that counter otherwise. I would think we had nothing in common. And it turns out we had a lot in common. And I was, I have such fond memories of him, even though I'll never see him again, <laughs> you know? So ask someone their story. That, that's, that's, the, that's my piece of advice. Having known you for 10 years, I'm not surprised with that response, but I love that response because the response is to ask somebody as opposed to just telling them about you. Um, and I mean, I, I just think that is such a profoundly good instinct to have. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that because I'm going to say how I said the same thing and it's going to make me sound really self-centered to be <laughs> praising this so much. But I, I, was on, I was on your end of an interview here about a, a month ago with a, with a program. And so it was before Thanksgiving and the, the interviewer said to me, what, what, what's your advice of talking to your family over, over Thanksgiving? And I said, well, what would you, what would you, what's your, what's your strategy? And I said, well, I said, I think the best thing you can do is to say, look, I know that you have strong feelings about this election. I'm going to shut up. And for five minutes, I'm not going to say anything. You tell me what you think about it. And I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say I agree or disagree. You just, you just tell me what you think. And I'm going to listen. I promise I will listen. I promise I won't say a thing. And they were really surprised with that answer. But it's, we spend so much of our time thinking, and we do need to have a voice. I don't want to diminish that, that we do need to be able to tell our story to tell what's important to us but there's so much power of just being able to say what's up you know what do you think you know what's what's your favorite or you know tell me what's important those kinds of things i think will go a long way of building the kind of bridges that that, that we would hope to build and i think that are really crucial for being able to maintain uh, a democracy quite frankly I mean, we have to find ways to be able to communicate and that's not going to happen just by yelling at each other and raising the decibel level of each person exchanging um, their, their, their yelling. Yeah, you need to tell your point. But like you said, to, to, to ask somebody a question, 
and to then listen to them is such a powerful step and something that anybody can do. Anybody yeah. can do that. Yeah, it's a key that unlocks doors for sure. And yeah, it could be as simple as who was your best friend when you were growing up? I mean, it's amazing what a little simple question can do to opening it just somebody just just telling you more about them than you probably have ever known by just chatting back and forth, you know? So yeah, that is a, that is a powerful tool. Well, I think we're pretty well at the end, although as I think anybody watching this can guess, we could keep going for, for, keep for going. quite a while. <laughs> it would not yes. be difficult for us, but uh, um, I get, I'll give you a chance for any final thing that you would like to say uh, to, to bid our viewers goodbye or any final thoughts, Kristen? Oh. Well, you know, I'd say don't doubt that your story is important. Do not doubt that your story uh, is important because telling your story even could, could literally save a life. I've, I've seen it happen so many times. I've literally seen someone sharing their story save someone else's life. Um, like somebody who, multiple times who were suicidal, I've seen a life be saved by hearing a story and n never underestimate the power of, of that um, in your own story. So I think that's, that's the most important thing. We're all storytellers in our own way, whether we work in you know, banking or storytelling or we're a, a stay-at-home parent, we're all telling stories. And it's really, I think, the key uh, to our, our collective you know, growth. Well, this was great. This was awesome. I want to thank Kristen very much uh, for being here and spending the time. I know she's a busy person given all the things that she's doing right now. Um, but I'm really grateful that you spent the time uh, with us. For those of you who are continuing on to next month, we have another treat, I think, in January. Uh, Capri Carofalo, who is a former state senator from in Ohio, has written a book of how food uh, and cuisine can bring us together. So we're continuing another kind of a cultural artifact or uh, this time we're going to be moving to food. And that was one I frankly hadn't thought of when I started this, which is one of the fun things about exploring this is you come up with ideas that you didn't think of in advance. So it'll be great fun. But Kristen, again, awesome. thank you very, very much. Uh, and, uh, thank and, uh, you. My pleasure, my pleasure. And we will see you all next month.